My name is Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. Bobby. Through the grace of God, sponsorship and the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found it necessary to have a drink or any other mood oil or chemical since June 2nd, 1988. And for that, I'm truly grateful. I have a home group. It's the underground group. We meet at the Old Pine Community Center on Tuesdays and Thursdays on the corner of 4th and Lombard at 8 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. We'd love to have you. This is only the third time I've been in the state of Arkansas. I was here about 10 years ago at Arkipa at Petty Jean, great spot. A few months ago, I was at uh, Hot Springs where I, might, where I met my friend Bud, and I actually saw him in the lobby yesterday, and he has graciously volunteered to interpret for anybody who may have a problem listening to me. Now, I, I, I don't know who the hell's gonna interpret for Bud, <laughs> but maybe between the both of us, you'll hear something. You know. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to come. It's always a privilege to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and towards the end of my drinking, I wasn't invited anywhere. So this is it. I'm supposed to tell you in a general way, no fifth step tonight. I will tell you in a general way what my life was like as an active alcoholic, what happened to me, and what my life is like today as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was born and raised in a very... Can everybody hear me? You're good. I never had a problem getting a drink in a... Uh, well, I, I can't. Uh, you can move on up. There's a lot of empty seats here. I never had a, pro I never had a problem getting a drink in a crowded bar. So, uh, but... Um, I was born and raised in a very blue collar, very ethnic neighborhood in Philadelphia. We had no booze in the house. I'm one of eight. I got seven brothers and sisters. My mother did not drink. My, excuse me, my father did not drink. My father never had a drink in his life, and my mother could not drink. My mother was pregnant for ten and a half years, and abused she was. I have a sister who's 11 months older than me. I am 11 months older than my next sister. There is eight of us in a 10 and a half year span. So besides being pregnant all those years, my mother also suffered from a history of mental illness and abuse prescription medication. And because my father did not drink, he was smart enough not to have any booze in the house. My grandparents lived around the corner from us, and that's where all the family functions are held, the graduations, the christenings, and things like that. And there was always a party. My father's one of 12, my mother from a much smaller family, she's one of 11, and so there was always a party. There was always a christening, there was always a graduation, you know? I loved my grandparents, and I loved their house, and I loved the excitement and the parties and everything that was going on. Their basement uh, was finished as a bar, but the kids from the neighborhood used to make fun of my grandparents because my grandparents were immigrants. Both, set, both sets of my parents were, uh, grandparents were immigrants, and the kids in the neighborhood used to make fun of them, the, the way they talked. Now, that's not right, but, you know, I just, you know, I just loved my grandparents. And I couldn't wait to get older so I can partake in uh, all the festivities there. That's where I had my first drink. I was just a kid. I didn't get drunk the first time I drank. I remember what it was. I drank, it was Ballantine beer. And I remember that because Ballantyne used to sponsor the Phillies. And I remember going up to Connie Mack Stadium with my father. And Ballantyne used to have that old scoreboard in right center field. And I was running around the basement bar polishing off the half empties or the half fulls. I guess it depends on your perception. And then my uncles were pointing at me and said, look at him, look at Bobby. See, I never felt a part of. And that's pretty tough to do when you have 10 people living in a small three-bedroom row home. But I never felt a part of. And it was the attention from my uncles that I kind of helped me out there along the way. And I never felt a part of in my entire life, even into early recovery. I always have this thing that I felt just a little different. My drinking, though, really kind of took off in high school. Most of the kids in the neighborhood went to the local diocese in high school. But my parents, both being children of immigrants, they knew the only way to make it in this country was by education. So they made a great deal of sacrifice to send my brothers and sisters to private school. So I went to this private Jesuit high school, and right away I felt kind of different because most of the kids who went to the school from a very fluent families from the suburbs. It was just me and a couple of the dirt balls from my neighborhood who went to the school. And right away we had a, we had a reputation. It was The school sat in an inner city, and a lot of these kids, as uh, we used to walk to school, so these kids were intimidated by us, you know? And we did things, uh, for instance, when these kids were getting dropped off by their parents in their luxury automobiles, me and the guys in the neighborhood were inside robbing the lockers. Now, I knew that was wrong. I knew that by the values instilled in me, by my parents as a kid, by the nuns as a kid. But I did it anyway because I had a lot of nicknames, and one of those nicknames was Crazy Coil. I would do things that my gut I knew was wrong, went against all the values and trainings and teachings I had as a kid. But the need for me to be accepted by you outweighed anything else. And I'm compromising principles and values from the very first start. 
And I remember, I mean, we did all types of stupid things. Like, we sold football pools, and if you hit, we didn't pay off. Like, what were you going to do? And you know what? They kept coming back and buying them. They wanted to buy a particular substance. We would sell you a substitute substance, you know? And they kept coming back and buying it off us. I mean, we went through more oregano than the pizzeria. We, th we thought we were gangsters. We weren't. We were idiots. That's all we were. But I have remember my freshman year at the prep. There was football season. There was an away game. We rented a bus. There was drinking. There was fighting. There was police activity. It was really a lot of fun. And I remember our first day back to school, we all had to go see the disciplinarian. And he had his little all outside, lined up outside his office, and there were about 10 of us, and they were all upperclassmen. It was just me and another kid for the neighborhood. We're the only two freshmen. And I remember the priest came up to us. He says, what's with you guys? You guys are here like two weeks, and you're getting this jackpot. And I just shrugged my shoulders. I said, you know, Father, it's just one of those things. See, I didn't play football, so I didn't hang out with those kids. And even though I did well academically, I didn't hang out with the AP kids. They were a bit weird. I was there about a week and a half. I found out who the nitwits were, and that's who I hung out with. And that would be the story of my life, hanging out with nitwits, you know? <laughs> Now, this is a tough school academically. I'm not making the dean's list, but I'm not failing out either. I'm giving the bare minimum effort required to get by. That, you know. And I remember, now this school sits in the corner of 17th and Gerard in North Philadelphia. Three blocks away is the subway. Well, at the end of the day, these kids would have to uh, take public transportation to get back to their uh, houses in the suburbs. So they used to wait for the trolley car to come pick them up to drive them the three blocks to the subway. It was a pretty rough neighborhood. They were actually scared to walk the three blocks. Well, two blocks away, there was a bar called the Ebony Showcase Lounge. And when I was a junior, I was a regular at the Ebony. And I went there for a couple different reasons. They had dancers, they had cold beer. But a lot of times we would go, we would walk out that street to show these kids from the suburbs how tough we were. And I'm telling you, they would wait 30 minutes for that damn trolley. I mean, you could walk back and forth four or five times before that trolley got there. But we would try to show off to these kids, you know, how tough we were. I'm not a tough guy. I never was. And every time I strolled out in that street and I sat in that bar, I was terrified. But I wanted anybody else to know. You know, crazy coil. I had a reputation to keep up, like I was a legend in my own mind. And you got to picture this. The name of the bar is the Ebony Showcase Lounge, so you know I'm not from the neighborhood. I'm what? I'm 17. I'm look like I'm 12. And they figured if we were crazy, Crazy enough to go in the bar, they crazy enough to service, you know. And we got these two, three little skinny little white kids sitting in this bar drinking. It was just nuts, you know. When it came time to graduate from the prep, I really had no desire to further my education, and I knew I couldn't stay home because it'd be hell to catch because my parents made these sacrifices to send me to the school. And I don't like to catch hell. I love to create it. I don't like to catch it. So I'm not going to. Uh, my options are limited. I'm 17, I got no money, I got no skills. What am I going to do? I enlist in the service. That wasn't a bright move. The military wasn't popular then, uh, you know, it was late 70s, it just wasn't popular, and uh, Carter was the president, so, but I had enlisted, and uh, after my, all my training, I got sent overseas for 13 months, and that's when my drinking really took off. I never messed around with other substances. I never even smoked a joint. I knew a lot of guys in my neighborhood who I got drafted or gone over overseas and whacked on certain things. I had a fear of other substances, but I had a drinking problem before I went in. When I was over there, a couple good friends of mine got killed, and I, know how to, I didn't know how to handle that. Because in my family, we didn't talk about nothing. It was all surface stuff, you know? And once you moved out of the house, whether you went away to get married or you went away to school, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. Everything stayed within the walls of the house, and everything stayed inside you. And that's not a shot of my folks. That's just the way it was. It was nothing we'd talked about. It was all surface stuff, you know? So when my friends got killed, I don't know how to handle that. But I drank the booze, booze numb the pain and that's what I did. And the same thing in the service. I'm not distinguishing myself, but I'm not getting any jackpots either. I'm giving them bare minimum effort required to get by. Doing my job, hope you don't even notice me, you know? When my tour was up, I came home. I wound up taking a couple civil service exams, and then I enrolled in school. I went to St. Joe's. And St. Joe's was a small school back then. I don't think we had more than 3,000 kids, you know, 15, 20, uh, maybe no more than 20 kids in a class. And uh, the same thing there. It, not making a dean's list, but I'm not failing out either. And I remember the end of the spring semester, a guy from the neighborhood called me up. He said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow. You know, one of those midday uh, businessman special, midweek, midday games. He said, you want to go to the game? I said, sure, because no one's missing me in the classroom. I'm not an active participant there. So uh, we cut class and we went to the Phillies game. Now, the Phillies at this time were playing at Vet Stadium in South Philadelphia. It was an unusually warm day. The sun's beating down on us and we're getting trashed. And I told one of the guys I was with, I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to run down in the field and meet one of the players. 
And they said, that's okay, Bobby. And because another, because they kind of shrugged me off, because another nickname I had was Bullshit Bob. I used to tell people, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I did that. I didn't do nothing. I just made stories up. I talked to you, I should have started off once upon a time. That's what I did. I told stories. I told stories and drank. I didn't do nothing else. So I had worked my way down to the picnic area, and the San Diego Padres were in town. And Dave Winfield was the right fielder for the Padres. And I went down, and I had jumped over the fence, and I ran out in the field. Now I'm running around. I go out, and I actually shake his hand. I said, hey, Dave, how you doing? And he looked at me, he said, brother, what are you doing out here? And he's a pretty big dude. And but from behind him, I saw the guards coming. I said, Dave, I got to go now. <laughs> and I started running towards the infield. I want to slide into second base. I don't know why. I just thought that'd be a pretty cool thing to do. So I'm running towards second base, and there was more guards coming from the third base side. And I knew I couldn't do that, because if I slid in a second, I'd get caught. So I start going towards first base. And at this point, I'm walking. And I'm as probably close as, as I am to Randy right now. Like, to give myself up, I'm walking towards the guard. At the last second, I deked the guy, and I ran out in the outfield. Now I'm running around like a screwball. It seems like 10 minutes. But you know, it's probably it's like two or three, right? But I got these guards, these young, short, fat guys. I mean, they're tripping over each other. It looks like Keystone on cops, right? You know, the place is going nuts. I'm joking and jiving, but you know what? I got nowhere to go. The fence is 12 feet high. I'm drunk. I'm out of breath. I'm about to get sick. So I just wait for them. I got nothing to do. So I wait out in the outfield for them where they finally got me. They take me off the field. I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. I swear to God, this is nuts. They took me up to the right field bullpen and Tug McGraw was in the bullpen for the Phillies and the Tugger gave me the thumbs up. Now, you know what? I knew these guards were going to, going to beat me because I made them look so stupid. You know what? They could have beat on me all day long because the way I figured this, I said, you know what? By the time I get out of jail, I'd be back in the neighborhood. I could drink off this story for at least a week. I actually pictured this as I was going to get my beating. Now, this would be a type of story I'd make up. Bullshit Bob, right? But I had those four guys from my neighborhood who definitely would have my back. Just as I was about to get my beat, and the Philadelphia police lieutenant showed up. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, I'm just happy. I'm just happy to be here. He said, well, you better get your happy ass out of the stadium. So not only did he save me from getting a beating, which I appreciated, also saved me from getting locked up. And that was important because about six weeks later, like one of them civil service exams kind of panned out, and I got hired by the Philadelphia Police Department. <laughs> They were hiring anybody back then, I tell you. Now, I'm not, only, I'm not even old enough to drink. The drinking age in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has always been 21. The drinking age in Jersey at that time was 18. And where I lived in Philly, I could be across a bridge in Jersey quicker than on other parts of Philadelphia. But I got on the job. We had a mayor at the time, a guy by the name of Frank Rizzo. And Frank was a former police commissioner and cop. He loved us. And we, could do, we were a gang. We were 8,300 strong. We were a gang with badges, and we did whatever the hell we wanted to do. And I need to back up for a moment. That, that story I talk about running on the field, I tell that story for a couple of different reasons. One, it, it's a true story. I got those four guys in the neighborhood. They could definitely back me up. Secondly, you know what? It's the only funny story I got. I wasn't a funny guy. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a lover. I was none of that stuff. I was a lying, thieving, stinking, falling down, violent, drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused everybody I came in contact with. I was a creep. Believe me, I was a creep. And thirdly, more importantly, I was a blackout drinker from the very first start, and I didn't know that. I remember when I eventually got sober, I was at the VA hospital, the doctor came up to me, he said, do you ever have any blackouts? I said, nope. I must have answered too quickly for him. He said, do you know what they are? I said, nope. <laughs> Once he described them, I said, all the time. That's how I thought you had a good load if you couldn't remember it. I remember coming up to the corner the next day and guys would be repeating stories like the stunts I pulled the night before. And I would be telling those stories a couple hours later like I had memory of myself. I'm a blackout drinker from the very first start. You know, so uh, I get assigned. I'm working up North Philadelphia, where I spent the first part of my career, and I would see the ravages of drug addiction and alcoholism day in, day out. I mean, just just a, a crazy area. The area I worked, the, the the newspaper now calls it the Badlands. I mean, it's it just nuts. And I loved it. I loved the insanity. I'm just caught up in the mix, you know. And you know what? The handwriting is on the wall. I met a family function one time, and my uncle was there. My uncle, he was a boss in the job, and he will pull me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You're going to get yourself in the jackpot. You better take it easy. A couple months later, I'm at work one day, and my immediate supervisor pulled me off to the side. 
He said, you know what, kid? You're smart and you're going to go places, but that booze is going to mess you up. In one ear and out the other. Several years later, when I got sober on two separate occasions, I ran into that supervisor and my uncle in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized at that point that they were trying to 12-step me. And I remember talking to my uncle Jimmy. I said, listen, how come you didn't tell me? And you know what? He gave me one of them old-timer smiles and said, Bobby, you just weren't ready yet. Which just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the nonsense that went, went, went with it was necessary for me to hit my bottom. I was 24 years old and I was involved in an incident in which a 15-year-old kid lost his life. And it was a terrible situation that could not be avoided. You know, they now have, the mental health professionals have a phrase out there, suicide by police, but 25, 20-some 20 years ago that that was not around. And I use that as an excuse to crawl in a bottle, and that's what I did for my next three years. I wound up getting sober when I was 27. Drinking took me to a lot of my nevers, and one of those nevers was actually drinking on the job. I said, I could never do this. But actually, the type of work that I'm doing, I wound up getting promoted and transferred, and like, I'm not hanging in the back of churches. I'm doing this work that I think I got to drink to maintain, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I'm justifying I got to drink. So one night I'm drinking, I'm on the job, and uh, I, I was put in a position where I thought I needed to do other substances, you know, and I. Uh, I use it as an excuse, and that's what I did, and I wound up getting involved in other substances. My drug history is very short. It lasted about 17 months, and out of respect to the fifth tradition, that's why I need to talk about that stuff. So please feel free to use your imagination, but it was, it was ugly. I was sitting home from work one day, and I'm reading the Daily News. There's an article, and at the end of the article, there's a phone number and a series of questions. This is a, and the questions were, I said, alcohol problems, drug problems, marital problems, thoughts of suicide, depression. I was four out of five, because I was single. But I'm sure if I was married, <laughs> I'd have been batting a thousand. And they talk about the moment of clarity. As soon as it came, it quickly left. But something made me cut that out, <laughs> out and I stuck on my wallet, and I continued on drinking. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1988. And guys I worked with, we were in some trouble, so we went to the bar after work to get our stories together. And one thing led to another, and it just turned out to be another drinking party. So one of the guys I was with decided that he needed to go home for some reason, God forbid, take care of some sort of family obligation. And I decided I would give him a ride home because I didn't think that I was as drunk as he was. And he thought that was a good idea. So we get in this car, and I get like, the brilliant idea. I'm going to show off my driving skills to this guy. See, I would see things in the movies or television. I said, I can do that. But I now know everything's like pre-designed, stump people. They, they said, all that. So you only see the finished product. But, so, but I said, I could do that, considering I'm not driving my car anyway. It's a city car, so it doesn't matter. Nothing happens. And it's just, just nuts how the arrogance is just always there. So I'm driving out this narrow one-way street, and there's a big wall on the left-hand side, about 10 feet high. And I see a kid riding towards me on a bicycle. And for some reason, I thought it'd be funny to see this kid jump the curb and grab the wall. I don't know why I thought that'd be funny, but I thought it would be. So I started to play chicken with this kid. And unfortunately, at the last second, we both turned in the same direction. I ran that kid over. As he lied bleeding on the hood of my car, I got out of my car with my nightstick, and I was going to beat this kid because I thought he was milking me or, in this, or the city for an insurance claim. The guy that I was with prevented me from, do that, from doing that. I took this kid off the hood of my car, threw him off the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crumpled bicycle from beneath my car, threw it out of the side of the street like a piece of trash. I drove back to the bar, made some sort of smart alcohol remark, and I continued on drinking. When I came to it the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think anybody helped me because I was such a creep. And believe me, I was a creep. My, my whole life, I, I was a creep. I hid behind the badge, I hid behind the bottle, but I, I, was, just a, I was just a rotten SOB. So I didn't think anybody would help me, you know. And so what I did do, I realized I was in serious trouble. So what I did do, I got a case of beer, a bottle of liquor, and some other substances, and I checked in onto, into a hotel to build up the courage and my life, to drink all the stuff to build up the courage and my life. And three days later, they're knocking on the hotel door to kick me out. And all the booze is gone, and the drugs are gone, and all that stuff. And at this point, I'm suspended from my job, so I no longer have access to my weapon, so I, so I couldn't shoot myself. So I walked over to the window, and I opened up the window, and I was going to jump out the window to end my life. But I, when I opened up the window, I was on the fifth floor. I remembered I was scared of heights. <laughs> Crazy. I made 23 jumps in the service. I never overcame my fear of heights. So I went in the bedroom, and I filled the bathtub up with water and had a blow dryer. I was going to pull the blow dryer into the tub to, uh, to like for like an accidental electrocution. But every time I pulled a blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. I was about a foot and a half short on cord. And I got one foot in the tub, and I'm leaning, trying to plug it in. And it's, it's just crazy. It's like the scene in that Woody Allen movie where he couldn't even kill himself. You know, it's just, it just nuts. 
So the only other tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin to the neighborhood. I started up the Falls Bridge. I come down the East River Drive, which is a very winding road along the Schuylkill River. And I decided whether at myself, I, I would go, I, I decided I would have a head-on collision to end my life. Because I handle jobs like this, head-on collisions at a certain rate of speed, that usually does the trick. And this was a mid, uh, mid-week day, mid-morning. It was like a Wednesday, Thursday, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And that would be important because if it was any other time of day, I probably would have succeeded what I set out to do. And I'm coming down the drive, and the speed limit's probably about 20, 25, and I'm doing about 50. And I'm kooked, and I'm hungover. I'm just whacked completely, you know. And I'm coming down the drive, and right before I decided to go on oncoming traffic, something flashed back. You know, I now know it was a grace of God, but I didn't know that then. I remembered I handled a job. I was young. I was about 22 or 23. And, I, um, and this is not even like on my top 50 things that bother me, but it, it just popped in at the, the, the appropriate time. I had to do a notification before, you know, and I, uh, so I'm, I'm 22, I guess, and I knock on this guy's door, and he's an older guy, everything's relative, he's probably late 30s, early 40s, and I had to tell him that his son was killed in an automobile accident. And I, like, I can remember this like yesterday, and all I did, I remembered a guy, he slumped against the door of his house, and the only way I can describe it is I actually saw the life leave this guy's eyes, you know? I was in court a few weeks later, uh, and I was coming down the corridor, and he had stopped me. I didn't even recognize the guy. He must have aged 20 years. And, uh, you know, and uh, there was no way, as much pain that I was in, there was no way that I could inflict that type of damage on an innocent family. I now know that was a grace of God. It wasn't left to me. But I was still in pain, and I couldn't cause that pain on innocent families. But I decided I would wrap myself around a tree. And I handle jobs like that. You hit those trees at a certain rate of speed. Actually, if you just get it right, it could split the vehicle in half. Or if you're not belted in, you get ejected and struck by another vehicle. That actually does the trick, too. And just then, I just lost it. And I'm surprised I didn't get it on accident by accident because I have no control at all, you know? And I pulled over at the East River Drive, and I just pulled over, and it's on my boathouse row. And I cried like a baby. I, you know, I'm just sobbing heavily, and it just, it's just really a mess. And I reached into my glove box where I always had an extra gun and the gun wasn't there. But inside the glove box was that wallet and inside my wallet was that article that I clipped out of Dalian O's about six weeks before. And this is no longer there but outside the last boathouse is one of those old glass enclosed phone booths. And I walked over to the phone booth and I dialed that phone number on that ad. And the woman who answered the phone, I spoke to that lady like I spoke to no one in my life before. I told her the truth. I told her everything that was going on in my sad, miserable life, and God bless her, she listened patiently. And she said, why don't you go over to Hahnemann Hospital, somebody be waiting to talk to you, and it's about a five minute drive. I said, okay. So I drove over, they were waiting for me, and they admitted me to their 10th floor their psychiatric unit. And they kept me there, got me stabilized, about three or four days. And from there I got transferred to the VA hospital out in West Philadelphia. And I spent about six weeks in their flight deck. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in Coatesville, where I would spend another few weeks in their flight deck, and then got put into an alcohol and drug ward. When I pulled over that day and made that phone call, Alcoholics Anonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. I really thought my problem was the short use of other substances. If I left that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe I got this mental illness, and I heard this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're talking about. I got this from the job. I got this from the neighborhood I lived in. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but it can't be alcohol because I'm a beer drinker, and there's no way that you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I mean, alcoholics were these poor people I was dealing with day in, day out on the streets of North Philadelphia. They were alcoholics. I'm very successful. I got promoted. I'm getting commendations. I'm a beer drinker. The only time I drank hard liquor really was like on like St. Patty's Day or New Year's Day or payday. But I'm a beer drinker. And actually, beer is really not even alcohol. I like liquor. Whiskey, that's alcohol. Wine, but not, not beer, but just nuts. But I later found out you could be an alcoholic drinking beer, you know. So uh, I got put into the alcohol and drug ward, and at this point, it's the first time in probably about eight weeks that I'm in a place that has a handle on both sides of the door. So it's amazing how quickly the arrogance creeps back in. So I got to scout the lay of the land, check it out. And I, wa- I have wind up in the day room. And the, in the day room, they had the large window shades of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions up on the wall. And I zip through the steps. I have about six of them done. I see the amends and said, they're screwed. I don't need to do that. Not my neighborhood. No amends. That's out. 
But what bothered me the most that night, two men would come up. I would later find out that they were part of the treatment facility committee. Did not, not know that then. I would find out later. They came up to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment that the speaker said something about his background that I did not like, did not identify with, or couldn't relate to, I would immediately tune him out. I was too busy listening to the messenger, not the message. And then I realized my decision to do something about my drink and was probably premature. For instance, I'm looking around the room and these guys are talking about wives who hated them, kids they couldn't stay, uh, see, stay away orders, uh, you know, custody, you know, uh, child support. I didn't have those issues. Probably due to the fact that I'd never been married, I didn't have any kids, may have had something to do with that. These guys are talking about legal problems. I had no legal problems, probably due to the fact because I had a gold shield in my back pocket. These guys are talking about employment problems. They couldn't get jobs. They're all whacked. You know, I never had that problem. I've only had two jobs in my life. I went from high school to the service to the city. I'm still with the city almost 30 years. I'm looking for the differences and not the similarities. But what bothered me the most, without any question, was at the end of the meeting when everyone got in circle and held hands and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what you people are about, I definitely didn't want nothing to do with you because I hated God. And I know those strong words, but it doesn't even begin to sum up the feelings towards God. And I hated God, and believe me, they were for all legitimate reasons. And one of the reasons I hated God the most was, I talk about my mom's mental illness, right? My mom was in the fundamentals movement, the charismatic movement in church, and she thought she could speak in tongues and all that stuff. And I'm 15 years old. I came home from school one day. I'm in the house about 10, 15 minutes. And I come across, I found my mother. My mother had slit her wrist. And she looked up at me, she said, Bobby, help me. I looked down, I said, good for you. And I walked out of the house. And I got an older guy to go to the state store to get a bottle of wine, and I drank the wine. I came home later that night, my father told me what happened. I acted surprised. That happened when I was 15, I was 27 when I got sober. That's 12 years of hating God, and that's a real good hate. And it'd be a few more years before I would even address this issue. So I'm not holding any hands, and I'm not saying any prayers, you know? And when I got out of the VA hospital, a nurse came up to me, and, he did t and I'm about to say this, and please, it's not to get a laugh. She had to be a member of Al-Anon, because she came up and she saw all through my BS, and she said, you know what, the only way you're going to make it, you're going to need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you that's the best piece of advice I got. And that's where I would get my recovery. I got my recovery in AA. I didn't get it at the VA hospital, but the VA hospital helped me tremendously. Man, they do great work. And... Like they drain the oil, they tighten the bolts. I mean, they really did some good work. But I got discharged and I went to AA every single day. Sometimes two or three times a day, depending on when I'm working. I don't drink coffee, I've never had in my life, so I don't make it. I don't smoke cigarettes, I've never had in my life, so I'm not emptying any ashtrays. I know that's not an issue now, but at one time it was. I walked into a big book meeting or step meeting that was strictly by accident. I would leave at the break, I have something more important to do. Tradition meetings, absolutely not. Rules, my line of work, we love to enforce them, we don't like to foul them, they're for other people. I ain't getting involved in those either. I'm interested in war stories, and the moment that the speaker said something about his background that I couldn't relate, to, didn't identify with, I immediately tuned him out. Too busy listening to the messenger, not the message. But I made meetings, I was a meeting maker, as crazy as a bed bug. I remember my very first outside meeting, there was a husband and wife celebrating 10 years of sobriety. And the wife had one more day than her husband, and she constantly reminds them of that throughout her story. And 10 years, let's come on, I can't believe that. 10 years, I don't think so. Maybe you go across the bridge and drink in Jersey, keep your Pennsylvania time. I don't know, I mean, I was whacked. But there was a dude from my neighborhood whose name was Troubles, and that's a hard-earned nickname. You get a name like Troubles. And Troubles was in and out of jail in the 60s and 70s, and my, he was in my very first day out, uh, outside AA meeting. I thought Troubles was dead or in jail. I had not seen him in years. And uh, he was in one line of work, I was in another line of work, so we didn't talk. I saw him in the meeting, like, but, but we gave the, the nod, you know, the dudes, hey, what's up? <laughs> I nodded to him, but he was looking good. He had this, uh, but, but I couldn't talk to him, you know. But uh, he's the only reason I came back. Because I saw this guy have a glow about him. I said, Christ, I said, he's sober? And I started asking around, I, saw, I found out he was sober a couple years, unbelievable. That's the only reason I came back to AA. I figured if it could work for a guy like him, for me, you know, I would stick it out for a little bit and see what the real deal was. You know, I, you got to, because I know there's an angle to everything. Because I always come across people playing the angles. I'm going to figure the angle out. But I'm nuts. I'm sitting in this bar one day, uh, drinking seltzer. It was cool. I was drinking seltzer. Because they sell real good roast beef. 
That was, that was what I would tell you 21 years ago. The truth was, the reason I was in that bar that day, see, I'm a very arrogant guy, and I'm getting a lot of press, and because I'm a very aggressive in my job, well, towards the end of my drinking, I'm getting a lot, a lot of negative press, the guys that I'm working with. So the reason I'm at that bar, to be truth, was don't believe the hype. I don't know who that guy was. Mistaken identity. I'm back. Things are cool. That's why I was in that bar. The arrogance comes back. So I'm in the bar, I'm drinking soda, a kid comes from the neighborhood, a couple guys came in really, and I guess they found it necessary to knock me down a couple pegs. You know, they come in and they just start giving me a hard way to go. You know, like, they, they were like busting my, they were, they were busting my shoes, giving me a hard way to go. And unfortunately, the one guy just got a little too close to me, and I was drinking seltzer out of a rock glass, and I stood up and I punched him in the face with the rock glass. He dropped, I opened him up, he bled like a pig. I remember the wagon crew came in uh, to take care of him, and I knew one of the guys on the wagon. He had pulled me off to the side. He said, what? he wanted to hear my version of the, uh, the events. And I had told them what happened, and I can still see the look of disgust in his eyes. He just looked at me with just pure contempt. He said, you know what? You're nuts. You better get the hell out of here. And I got out of there, and I could have really got jammed up. That would have been a serious jackpot. But that's how nuts I was. But I since found a place that sells real good roast beef without being in that type of environment. But I was an idiot, you know? I celebrated my first anniversary, and my group at that, at that time, you would tell your story. We do it a little bit differently now, but you would tell your story. So I got done speaking. It was amazing. It was thunderous applause. The blind could see. The lame walked. It was truly miraculous. <laughs> and people came on the back, and they patted me on the back and said, way to go, Bobby. You're doing so good. I lied during my entire story. I even identified myself as an alcoholic because in my, in my group, that's all you could talk about that. You couldn't talk about the other stuff. I really didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I thought my problem was, again, was the short use of other substances. Maybe I got this mental illness. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're now talking about. I got that from the job or the service. This, that, but it can't be booze because I'm a beer drinker. You can't be an alcoholic drinking beer. In fact, during the, uh, my story, a bottle of beer, a beer appeared in my head, but you guys didn't want to hear that. You want to hear all the quotes and all the stuff and I was a pretty sharp guy. I knew how to hold on to information and give it back to you. And that's what I did. I was just parroting. And when you came up and you patted me in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good, I was dying inside. Unbelievable. I was sober 23 months and beat another man with a baseball bat. Forget what step I was working that day. But I was just nuts. I did everything wrong you could do in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't drink. I was a liar, thief, and a cheat. I was a creep with the new women. I did everything wrong in AA. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't pick up a drink. You know, I, it was just, it was pathetic. I was at this meeting one Friday night, and like half the group is, the attendance is, half the attendance is whacked. I said, where's everybody at? I'm there Saturday, the same thing. No one's there. Sunday night, they were all away for the weekend on a retreat. And I'm telling you, the worst meeting to go to is Sunday night after a retreat. Here they come. <laughs> They're all floating in, and I said, oh, Christ, uh, uh, the serenity damn near killed me. And they're all, you know, you know the old saying, uh, you can't miss what you never had? Well, I never had a piece, uh, peace of mind, so I never missed a damn thing. So they were sitting here, and I said, oh, man. And the only thing I did right in, in recovery, I never left a meeting. That, that, that's the only thing. I mean, I've done everything else you could wrong, uh, do wrong, but I never left a meeting. And I would sit there, i get so uncomfortable. But you know what? And very rarely would I share in a meeting. The only time I shared, like serene people scared the hell out of me. So if it was getting a little too calm, I would get my hand up to get it crazy. Now to set the room off, now I felt more comfortable. And then I would go to the men's room or get something to drink and come back to me, uh, come back to my seat, and the seat next to me would be empty. They'd be sitting on the other far side of the wall. They couldn't get further away from me. I mean, I was just nuts. We had a cork board, an anniversary board, first name, last initial, date, a month, date, and how many years you're celebrating. I'm not proud of this, but like if Joey A had three years and Bobby C had two years and Joey A went out, I said, good, he's out, I'm in. I mean, we're talking about time. Everyone's saying how long they're sober. I'm thinking like seniority, like the union. He's out, I'm in. I was just nuts. I swear to God, I had no idea who John Ballercorn was. I, was one of his, I said, man, why is everybody blowing this guy's anonymity, you know? He must be real. I swear, I, I said, he must be really tough SOB. When I found out who John Barleycomb was, I felt so stupid. But here I was, I was, da I was so damn bright, it damn near killed me. No one asked me to be their sponsor. No one want what the, what the hell I had. I didn't carry the message. I carried the disease, you know? I used to go, like, my first couple years, I would go, like, to a lot of gentlemen's clubs, right? 
but I drank soda, it was all right. And I would get like my picture taken with the entertainer, right? And then I would come to the meetings and pass the picture around to the old timer because I knew they would like that. <laughs> and I remember they would look at the picture and they would look at me and they would just shake their head and say, please kid, please keep coming back. And I thought they were being facetious. So I said, all right, I'll keep coming back. I, I'm telling you, it, it was not. At the end of the meeting, everyone goes to the diner. We got a diner on every corner. There's a diner or a tap room, right? And so they, they would come up to me and say, Bobby, I mean, you would have to run over me to get out of the meeting. And they say, Bobby, we're going to the diner. You want to go? I said, nope. But God forbid you never invite me. I mean, I'd hold that resentment on God at least to the next meeting, the next night. Uh, but I would never go. And you know what? Uh, these guys, I know I make fun of them, but the truth is they were good men. Time after time, they put the hand of AA out there, and I was such an idiot, I just slapped it away, you know? One weekend, they came up to me, and they kind of tricked me. And the way you trick somebody, you don't give them a chance to formulate the lie. They came up to me, and they say, Bobby, are you working this weekend? And I said, no. And it was unbelievable, because I only get seven weekends off a year. I work six days on and two days off. So it's seven weekends a year I'm off. And that particular weekend, I was off. They said, good, because we're going on a retreat this weekend, and we're going to take you with us. And you know what? I didn't want to go, but a part of me, like, I knew that I would be safe with these guys. But the truth is, they knew I had a problem with God. Now, I'm sober long enough in AA, and I knew that you couldn't get kicked out. But I'm also sober long enough in AA to know that not everyone is always greeted as warmly as the next person. And there was no way that I can tell them about my mom. Like, what would they think of me then, you know? So we get in the car on a Friday afternoon. They put me in the back seat, and there's a big, side, a big guy on each side of me. It's like role reversal, because at work, I drive, and you're in the back, right? So I'm going to this <laughs> retreat house, and the closer we get to the retreat house, the bigger the knock gets in my stomach. Like, so what are these guys going to, you know? But a part of me, I felt safe with them. But believe me, I was terrified. So we get there. It's like a Friday afternoon. It's like 4.30, 5 o'clock. They say, Bobby, we want to introduce you to the retreat master. I said, oh, come on. Let's get this over with. They take me down this long carpeted hallway. They knock on the door. The guy says, come in. I come in. He stands up. He puts his arms out. He wants to hug me. He's my disciplinarian from high school. But not only that, but he's a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, how you doing? I said, good, Father. How you doing? And he wants the 411, you know, where I'm going to meetings, and, I, and I'm giving him the information, you know. He said, who's your sponsor? I says, I don't have one. See, I'm a pretty smart guy. He knew I was a smart guy. He said, I, he said, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. So I asked my roommate to be my sponsor. God forbid, should I ever be questioned again? Who's your sponsor? There he goes right there. And the only time I talked to this guy is when I accidentally bumped to him in the meetings. I would see him at meetings and he'd say, Bobby, I still got that same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. I never called him. Know what I used to do? I used to talk about the guy. I used to go to like my friends outside. Man, I said, that guy's nuts. He wants me to do this. He wants me to do that. He didn't do nothing. I made it up. He put the hand of AA out there. I slapped it. And then I character assassinated the guy to boot. That's how much of an idiot I was. My second anniversary came. I didn't celebrate it. One month after my second anniversary, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had before, 25 months before, but 25 months before I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober, making regular, teen, uh, regular attendance meetings with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, wa I want to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life was unmanageable. I go to a meeting on Friday night, and I see Troubles there. And I go up to him uh, after the meeting, and, I say, and he didn't like to be called Troubles. I mean, he was a pretty tough dude. He'd be called whatever he wants to be called. So I go up to him at the meeting and said, Bobby, I said, I need some help. I said, can, can I talk to you? He said, sure. And then he starts, yeah, and I can tell, I said, maybe he likes me, you know, so I'm sticking my chest down. I said, Bobby, I said, I need a sponsor. Would you be my sponsor? And he looked me dead in the eye and said, Bobby, I've been watching you these past couple years, and I need to tell you, you're full of shit. <laughs> That's not the response I'm looking for. <laughs> He said, I'll be your sponsor under certain conditions. You're going to go to a big book meeting. You're going to a men's meeting. You're going to a step meeting. You're going to get yourself a coffee commitment, and you're going to leave them damn women alone. And I'm talking to myself. Who is he talking to? I'm sober 25 months. I'm selling the grapevines. I got it going on. But what I did do, I looked him dead in the eyes. and said, okay, that's what I'm willing to do. Because I was really scared of the guy, to be honest. But the truth is, you know what? I felt safe around the dude. It was, it was just a weird feeling, you know, intimidated, but I also felt safe too. Because I knew the way this guy used to live. I mean, he was a guy not to be tangled with. But you know what? He wasn't carrying himself. I mean, he's like one of these dudes, you know, he's tough, but 
he doesn't carry himself that way. And, and he was treating women with dignity and respect, you know, and people trusted this guy. And like, I really, I know his background. Uh, actually, he had, he had gone to prison for taking someone's life. So uh, that's not why he asked him to be my sponsor. But there was just something about him that I just felt safe with. So uh, he takes me back to his house. He, uh, he, told, he introduced me to the big book of alcoholics. And I'm, he, he's really not, not a lot of formal education and kind of some rough language, but that's what I needed, you know? He told me in, in colorful terms that I didn't know nothing about recovery, so I just shut up and listened to him. And he introduced me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we went through the first two steps that night, and then at the, we got to this, the third step prayer. We got on our knees, and that got me kind of concerned. I thought maybe he was in jail just a little too long. And we got on our knees and to say the third step prayer. And the truth is, you know what? Again, as comfortable as I was, there was something about him. And I now know, again, it was God. It was the intervention of God. And I felt safe. So I got on my knees and said the third step prayer with him. He said, Bobby, the way we do a third step, we pick paper and pen up and do a fourth step. I said, whoa, whoa. Easy does it. <laughs> so let's keep it simple. How about I just go to a meeting and just don't drink, you know? And I'm making fun of the slogans, and the slogans serve an, appro an appropriate, their appropriate purpose. But I'm using the slogans as an excuse not to do any work. I used to be one of these guys, I'm turning it over. That should have been code right there, I'm not doing nothing, you know? So I did my inventory, and no big deal. Everything I wrote down, I did, not a big deal. But that next step, that fifth step's a pretty big deal. So I called my sponsor up. See, I got the angle, I figured it out. I called him up. I said, Bobby, I'm, I'm going to go on a retreat this week. I'm going to do that fifth step with a priest. He said, man, that's fantastic. When you get done, stop by my house so you can do it with me. <laughs> and you know how there's sometimes you're on the phone with your sponsor and you feel like you're deaf. Do you hear what I said? But before I could say anything, he must have picked up on it. You know, he said, Bobby, I am your sponsor. The next two steps are character defects. I need to help you with them. And in order for me to help you with them, I think I need to know what they are, even though I have a good idea. And he hung up on me. Now, I need to tell you why I want to do the fifth step with the priest. It wasn't to be spiritually enlightened. It was none of that stuff. I have the resentment. I still have God on the resentment. And I hate God still. At, at this point, I should say. At this point, I hate, hate God. The only reason I want to do the fifth step with the priest, because of my indoctrination as a kid, I knew that whatever I told the priest would be between me, him, and a lamppost. Nobody else would know. It wasn't to be spiritually enlightened. In fact, there were a lot of things in my inventory that I was afraid to go to my sponsor. I thought that he would ridicule me. I thought he would pass judgment on me. Or even worse, I thought he would betray the confidence and disclose to other people what I was about to tell him. Which kind of tells you that my fear list isn't quite done yet. I never did that fifth step with the priest. I did it with my sponsor, and he did none of those things. He didn't ridicule me. He didn't pass judgment. And to the best of my knowledge, he never told anybody else what I told him. And in fact, what he did, he shared some of his experience with me, you took, which took away the terminal uniqueness in which I thought I was the only guy to have certain thoughts or done certain things. And I'll be forever grateful for him doing that, you know. When I got done, I'm about to leave his house. He said, yo, where are you going? I said, well, home. He said, no, no, no. You got to sit quietly here for one hour. Now, he lived by himself. He had a small house. He had a second bedroom was set up as a quiet room. And I sat in there. Now, I'm a type of guy, like I said, I can never sit quiet at all. Like, I'm always jitterbugging, you know. I just, and I tell you, serene people scare the hell out of me. So I sit in this room, and it had to be a little bit more than an hour because he knocked on the door to check on me. And I know God is my judge. I did, I did not off. At this point, I'm probably sober about 32, 33 months. I wish I could tell you differently. I wish I could tell you I got involved in the steps right away, but that has not been my experience. I didn't wake up one day and decide I was going to be a decent member of humanity and AA and get involved in the steps. You know, my, I, I got involved in the steps through pain and desperation. I didn't get involved in the, in the steps through any volition of my own. So at this point, I'm 32, 33 months sober. And the only way I can describe it, the feeling after that sitting quietly for that one hour, is that the screaming inside stopped. Now that may not sound like a lot to you, but you know what? It was a tremendous relief to me. Because this is, I actually, when I did my fist set with him, I told him about my mom. I, 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 everything, I was free and clear. And it was an incredible experience, you know? And uh, it, it was just incredible. Now, I didn't burn my fourth step when I did my fifth step because he, he said I would, know, I, I would need it for the rest of the steps. I mean, six or seven character defects. I didn't know what these were. I knew when I drank that I was a character. 
I found that when I did my inventory that I had no character whatsoever. I tell people I didn't have a spiritual awakening, I had a root awakening. I, had, I thought very highly of myself until I wrote this stuff out and I see it in black and white. I have no character whatsoever. I think I'm the greatest cop in the city. Not true. I engaged in behaviors that brought dishonor among my co-workers. I worked with men and women who did the exact same type of work that I did and they served with integrity and they did it without doing drugs and the things I was doing. I thought I was a great uncle because I would hook my nephews and nieces up with nice gifts because I was single. I had some money. The truth was uh, I was a horrible uncle. I was a worse son and I was a rotten brother. Uh, I, towards the end of my drinking, I'm not even allowed to show up at events anymore because they don't know what type of condition I want to show up in. My oldest sister, I love my sister. I mean, uh, you know, it's when you get a big family, you usually pair off with somebody, but for me, it was my sister. My sister and I, I loved my sister. I would have done anything for my sister. I would give my life for my sister. So we, uh, she gets married, 1981, punk rock days. I'm not a punk rocker, never was. I want to give you that impression. But I love dating them. Lots of fun, right? <laughs> So I date this girl, we show up at my sister's wedding, she's wearing a leopard skin miniskirt. Now I know that's not wedding attire, but uh, she looked good and I'm sure my uncles liked it. Now we show up, we're late for the service. So we slide in the last pew and said, let's slide back, you know, we'll wait till it's over, you know. At the end of the service, my sister walks down the aisle and our eyes meet. And I can see the look of disappointment and hurt in her eyes. She actually told me the night before, she said, Bobby, please. Can you just take it easy? Just have a good time, but just take it easy. She, she doesn't understand the disease. And I really didn't want to embarrass my sister. I love my sister. I just like, like getting loaded just a little bit more. My father is walking down the, the aisle behind my sister. He has a whole different look in his eye. So I told the girl, I said, you know what? I said, they're going for pictures. We probably shouldn't go. Let's go get a couple drinks and we'll just slide into the reception. No one will even see us. We come into the reception, I mean, we're twisted. I mean, we're just three sheets to the wind. It could be like a commercial for Southwest Airlines. You know how you want to get away, you do something dumb. She came in, and you know these trays that servers put all the dinners on, like they got like eight or ten dinners on the big tray? Well, she came in, and she tripped and fell into one of those things, and like ten dinners went clattering to the floor. And there was like, it was almost, it's just like the music had just stopped. I mean, everything could, that could go wrong went wrong at this particular moment. And it just like stone quiet, and then you hear all this dinner hit the floor, and there are like 300 people, and they all turn around, I got like 300 sets of eyes on us, you know? Here it is, it's supposed to be the happiest day in my sister's life. And for me, it was more important to get loaded than anything else. Like, how do I make amends for that, you know? So, uh, the sixth step, I became willing. And if I don't have the willingness, I pray for the willingness. And the seventh step, my, my sponsor said, Bobby, you need to put legs in those prayers. I have all so sorts of character defects, you know. Let's say one of them is, sometimes I'm not the most patient guy. And I can pray all day long, God, help me be patient, help me be patient. But during the course of my day, should you cross my path and, and, and you try my patience and I lash out, that prayer for patience goes right out the window. I was taught that God will do for me what I can't do for myself, but this is a program of action. The A step, because I didn't burn my fourth step, half my A step was done. Now I used to be one of those guys, I never harmed anybody but myself. That should have been a tip off, I never did my inventory. Because once I did my inventory, I found out I harmed everybody I came in contact with. And for me, unfortunately for me, those closest to me, I harmed the most, you know. And I, so half my list is done and I throw more names down there. And the ninth step, direct amends. No phone calls or no letters from me because you know why? Because I didn't beat you with a bat through the mail or over the phone. And whenever I get the urge to make a phone call or write a letter, I can give you hundreds of reasons. But, but I'm really honest, I'm probably afraid to face you. And I will always taught that if I get stuck on any particular step, I should fall back on the immediate previous step, and that would help me. And I'd like to share two experiences on the ninth step real quick. I'm at this meeting one time, uh, this is probably about 19 years ago, I see this guy walk down the steps, I have not seen this guy since 1977. He is not on my A step list, not for any fear, I just plain forgot. Out of sight, out of mind. They say more will be revealed. As soon as he walked down the steps, I recognized him immediately, he did not recognize me. I got introduced to speak, I stood up, I, look, I looked him dead in the eye, I said my name is Bobby Coyle, I'm an alcoholic. Now I need to take a quick moment and tell you why I use my full name.
All of a sudden, I know when we get sober, it's like we join the mafia, right? Everyone gets a nickname. There's like John the Brick and Jimmy the Coat and Frank the Fox and Pepsi George and Bucktooth Mary and Red Sweater Jerry. Like everybody got a nickname, right? God forbid I don't want anybody to know I'm an alcoholic. Everybody in my neighborhoods knows I'm a stark, raven, lunatic drunk. There's those little telltale signs. They come outside, they catch me, I'm urinating on their car. My girlfriend threw the clothes out the window. Everybody knows I'm a drunk. God forbid my reputation should be tarnished by going Alcoholics Anonymous. You want to go visit an old timer, you go to the hospital, yeah, I'm here to see John the Brick. I mean, God, it just doesn't work that way. Four o'clock in the morning, you feel like drinking. You call information, yeah, I'd like to have Frank the Fox's phone number. It's just nuts. This is not a secret society. In fact, the 11 tradition says, personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. That means you will never see my face clearly identified on the television or in the newspaper, followed by my full name, hear it on the radio, which is Robert Ignatius Benedict Coyle III, followed by the statement, is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a violation of the 11th tradition. Dr. Bob went on to say, when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that's a violation of the 11th tradition. He actually went on to say that anonymity is spiritually inspired and secrecy is feared inspired. This is not a secret society. In fact, I was very involved in the area back home and we use our full names, you know? It's just, it's not a secret society, you know? However, I have no right to break your anonymity. You choose not to use your full name, I'm cool with that. I shouldn't even tell anybody else, you know? So off that soapbox, back to the meeting, I looked this guy dead in the eye and I said, my name is Bobby Quill, I'm an alcoholic. And then he recognized me and then he nodded. He was a big guy. I used to fight big guys. I don't know why I liked fighting big guys. I wasn't good at it, but I, uh, I did it anyway because I hated bullies, you know? I don't know how many times I got my I, I got beat up for getting involved in business. I had no business getting involved in. Maybe they deserved to get beat up, but I just didn't like bullies. I always came to their, the other guy's defense. So this guy was a big guy, and from that point on, I would publicly humiliate them. I was engaged in behavior that I despised myself. Verbal taunts, you know. One day I slapped him open-handed. He didn't do nothing. And then one day I spat upon him. You're talking the utter degradation of spitting on another human being. It doesn't get any lower than that. So I looked him dead in the eye, uh, his name was Bob, and I said, Bob, I, because I was always told making amends is much more than saying I'm sorry. For me, I'm sorry are two words that don't mean squat. I was taught that making amends is about righting the wrong. And like the, and the financial amends are easy. I go in my pocket and pay you, or if, I make a, if it's a great sum of money, I go on a, on a payment plan with you. But what about the psychological damage or the emotional damage? How do I make amends for that? Like how do I make the amends to my sister for her wedding? How do I make amends to my dad for what happened to my mom? How do I make amends to this guy? So I thought that if I publicly humiliate him, the best I can do is make amends to him publicly. It wasn't a grandstand. So I told the group what I used to do to him. And I looked him dead in the eye and said, Bob, I'm truly sorry. As long as I stay sober, I hope I never treat another human being the way I treated you. You know what? He came up and he hugged me. He forgave me. It was a tremendous experience. So at the end of the meeting, we start talking. I said, Bob, I haven't seen you in years. How you doing? He said, Bobby, I'm sober three years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, get out of here. Now the arrogance creeps back in because everybody in Philadelphia knows me because I'm involved. I'm doing the deal. I'm not saying everybody likes me. I'm just saying that everybody knows me. And so with this meeting, we're in North Philadelphia. I live in South Philly. He lives in North Philadelphia. And no, he actually lives in Roxborough. It's like Northwest Philly. But this meeting's in North Philadelphia. This is a meeting he and I normally would not go to. I said, Bob, what brings you here tonight? He said, Bobby, I was just flipping through the meeting directory and I just wanted to go to a different meeting. I was just kind of bored. I wanted to check out a different meeting. Our meeting directory is 90 pages thick. We have 1,600 meetings a week in the city of Philadelphia. And he said, for some reason, this meeting just jumped out at me. I am a firm believer that God put that guy in my path that night and I had two options. I can do what I did or I can do what I always did, which is, when you have eight siblings in a ten and a half year span, there is a very close resemblance. And people would come up to me and say, hey, you coil, I, you S I, I got you, I know it's you. I said, oh no, you got me confused. You're talking about my brother Brian and my brother Sean, not me. And they look at me and they knew that I was lying. And I had to make amends to my brothers over that, but it was just nuts. I'd like to tell you another experience on the ninth step. For a while there, my home group was the Stepping Stones group. 
I'm at a meeting on a Sunday morning in a business meeting. I made a motion. It had to be better for AA because I made the motion. You know? Unbelievable thing happened. The motion doesn't get seconded. I've never seen it happen before. Every motion gets seconded, even though you know it doesn't have a chance to pass anyway. You feel sorry for the poor guy making it, and you don't want to look that bad. Well, my motion doesn't get seconded. And what makes it even stranger is that my boy Freddie is in the room. I'm making eye contact with him, like I'm going through fits, like to catch his attention. Now, I grew up in a neighborhood, there's certain rules. Everyone knows what they are. For instance, you always had your boys back. It didn't matter. If you're out of the neighborhood, you're getting a fight, even if he started it, which he always did, and you got beat up, you and him could discuss that later. You always had your boys back. It's a loyalty thing. Two, you never date anybody else's ex. Absolutely not. I don't care how cute you are. I like you, but you went that Frankie's prom. I can't talk to you. I'm sorry. You can't. You just don't do that. So I'm making eye contact with this guy. I said, listen, like, get my back here. My, he looks right through me. My motion goes down in flames. It doesn't even get seconded. I would come to the meeting afterwards. I'd say hi to everybody in the room. I'd see him, and I wouldn't even say hi to him. He would say hi, Bobby, and I just look at him. I looked at him with contempt. I'm at work one day. My coworker came up to me. He said, Bobby, Freddie Wheels is outside. I want to take care of some sort of business. I peeked out the window. My coworker, he was in the room still. I took a uh, peek out the window. I said, you know what? Tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall. He can't do that here. A couple weeks later, that same coworker called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels died last night. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. As God is my judge, I cannot tell you what that motion was about. That's how petty it was. Here was, a, here was a guy who was a friend of mine, and he was a friend, but I wasn't. He was put in my path numerous, numerous times. As God is my judge, I cannot tell you what that motion was about. That's how petty it was. He was put in my path many, many times. And I thought, you know what? I'd make amends in my time. And you know what? That's not what this step says. It says wherever possible, not whenever. Because whenever's time and wherever's place. And for me, it's never the right time because I'm too busy, easy doesn't it? And the moment that my coworker said, Bobby, because you always spoke so highly of you, I felt about yay big. And I've been praying for Freddie ever since. See, that's two experiences on the ninth step. Once where I took the action and I reaped the rewards. And once I can't tell you ample opportunity time after time after time. And I didn't take the action and I paid the price. The 10th step for me is nothing but the practice for, th for uh, it's nothing but the practice of four through nine on a regular basis. Now, if I'm standing up here and telling you I do the 10th step every day, that's not true either. But I'm pretty good, two, three, four, five times a week, once a week. You know, and I always used to say if I'm not practicing these principles on a daily basis, no one knows but uh, me. That's not true either. See, when I'm not practicing these principles, I operate in nitwit mode. And when I operate in nitwit mode, should you cross my path, you too are affected. I tell you, a few years ago, it was my job. I had to get the bread for the, the anniversary. So I'm up at the, uh, up at the bakery. I grab the bread. And I, when I drive, sometimes I get like Tourette syndrome. I don't know. Like I flip things off. I, cur I, I just, and I know it's a problem. So I try to, I say, God help me be with patience. Well, there's one particular day, this guy beeped at me and I flipped. I just went nuts. So I'm at the anniversary that night, and Carl came up to me. Carl just passed away. Every AA community has a guy like Carl. I mean, this dude's just like a spiritual, just a decent human being. He got this glow about him. He's sober 40-some years. He came up to me and said, Bobby, can I talk to you after me? And I said, sure, Carl. I thought maybe he wants to ride home. He's getting older. He doesn't drive at nighttime. So I, I said, Carl, what's up? He said, Bobby. He said, I saw you over Dirt and Poplar today over by the bakery. <laughs> He said, I beeped and waved, and you waved back. And I was so embarrassed. I says, like, I shouldn't, you're not allowed to flip anybody off, but here I'm flipping Carl off. And when he told me, he said, he said, I beeped and you waved back. He said it, and he had a twinkle in his eye. Like, he, he was like busting my stones, you know, like shoes. He was giving me a hard way to go. But I, I couldn't believe it. I said, man, like, I'm going, now how I flipped Carl off, you know. I never got away with nothing. I thought I did. I, I, I never got away with nothing. Never. The 11th step, I, I pray and meditate on a daily basis. I don't want to stand up here and tell you how I do it for one reason and one reason only. I don't want to offend anybody, you know, um, because I knew how I would have felt at my first meeting as someone told me how to pray and meditate. But the one thing I will tell you, I am glad that Alcoholics Anonymous gives me the freedom 
to, exper- to try a couple different ways to pray and meditate. Because if there were only one way to pray and meditate, I guarantee you, you would have a different speaker tonight. I would not be here. In my early recovery, not only did I not pray, but I could not even respect your right to prayer. I would cause a big scene at the end of the meeting. The, the body language, the heavy sighs, kicking my chair because, because I was uncomfortable. I now know through the steps that the problem wasn't the church. Actually, to be honest, I get uncomfortable when people bash the church. The church wasn't the problem. My mom was just mentally ill, and unfortunately, that's what tortured people do. They take their lives. The problem wasn't the Air Force. It wasn't the police department. It wasn't the neighborhood I lived in. I was the problem. Bobby Coyle. I was the problem long before I picked up a drink. Drinking just exasperated the problem. And once I put the booze and the other stuff down, I still was the problem, you know? So I pray and meditate on a daily basis now, and I've been doing the way I pray and meditate. I've been doing for about 10 years, and I'm comfortable with it, and that's all that's important, you know? And I thank you for giving me the freedom. The 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening, I've had that spiritual awakening. We tried to carry this message. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been to thousands of meetings. I've heard some crazy things, and sometimes I gotta scratch my head and look up the slogans to make sure I'm in an AA meeting. That's the message. But it says, tried to carry this message. See, I went through my evangelical stage. I went through the book, and I had the book. This is the only way to do it. I would quote the book. When I get done, I would backhand you with the book to make sure the message sunk in. You know, I tell you, that, 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 that group from Memphis who was here today, they did a beautiful job. But you know what? Uh, there was a lot of truth to that, too, though. Uh, that's why I even found it funnier, you know. But I was one of those guys. I was using the big book as a weapon, not a tool, you know. But the most important part of that 12 step is to practice these principles in all of our affairs. I'm only in an AA meeting an hour and a half a day. What about the other 22 and a half hours? What about the time in my job where it's tough to uh, practice these principles? What about the time with my family in my neighborhood, you know? I can sound like the second coming of Bill Wilson in AA, but catch me outside, you know? Catch me going to the bakery, flipping Carl off (laughs) at 19 years of sobriety. I mean, it's just nuts, you know? I'm not the poster boy of Alcoholics Anonymous. I invite you to come live with me for a week. See what type of guy that I am. I know I'm not the guy that I was 21 and a half years ago. I like to think I'm not the guy that I was three years ago. Except that one day I acted out with car. I make mistakes. Making mistakes doesn't get me loaded. It's defending those, those mistakes or justifying those mistakes that will lead to the arrogance or even not learning from those mistakes. That's what will lead to the drink. I'm just a regular guy from the neighborhood trying to do the right thing, and for the most part, I do pretty good. But there are days I fall short, and I try not to beat myself up. And it's the same thing like the guys I sponsor. They say, man, I got angry today, and they're all beating themselves up. I said, there's nothing the matter with anger. Oh, it's only a problem when you take a little too far and you commit aggravated assault. That's a problem. <laughs> Anger's okay, you know? Lust is okay, until if, if, unless you're in a committed relationship and you, you, you step outside. That's the problem. We make mistakes, I make mistakes, but I, I just try not to make the same mistake. And I don't want to hear, and I used to be one of these guys, all oh, progress, not perfection. The key word is spiritual progress. I have to learn from that. I got, I'm responsible for the effort, not the outcome, you know? Then I got involved in service, and I, uh, I love the traditions. I know I'm not gonna get into it, but I love the traditions. The traditions are to the groups, what the steps are to the individual. The steps are how it works, the traditions are why it works. And we, do, we, we read the traditions at, the, at a meeting every single day, and I'm sure you guys do too, even though you may not know they're doing it. Listen to the preamble. The preamble is nothing but a condensed form of the, uh, a, a condensed form of the traditions, that's all it is. Traditions are based on our experience. It's based on our first 11 years of experience of making mistakes. And that's how the traditions came about. So making mistakes is cool. Making mistakes is not going to get me loaded. Won't get you loaded either. But I have to learn from those mistakes. I have a responsibility. We actually have a statement. I'm responsible when anyone anywhere reaches out for help. I want the hand of AA to always be there. And for that, I am responsible. Again, going back to the preamble. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. If I'm only staying sober and not helping alcoholics, that's half measures, and half measures about us nothing. It doesn't say half measures about us something, half measures about us a little, half measures about us nothing, you know? So I make regular tenants at meetings. I, I really believe that the obsession to drink has been removed from me. The reason I go to meetings is because the newcomer doesn't know that I live at 707 Sears Street. 
Now, I don't go to as many meetings as I used to when I first got sober. I cut back. I probably go to about five, six meetings a week. And I, I like going to meetings. You know, I, I got a pretty good life today. Uh, I actually have full season tickets to the Philadelphia Phillies and the, uh, baseball. <laughs> I know, tough World Series, and hockey. And you know what? I share these tickets uh, with program guys. I mean, I can, I can interact with the real world, but uh, everything I do is uh, with guys in, in sobriety. I have a pretty good life today. What's my life like today? Uh, I, I'm still with the city, almost 30 years of service, but I'm no longer a police officer, so, so please, those with warrants, you can relax. <laughs> You need to take care of that stuff, though. We have computers. That's like back in the day when we lost paperwork. That doesn't happen anymore. To <laughs> take care of that stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, I wound up getting uh, stabbed in the line of duty a few years ago, uh, pretty severely, and uh, it's the only job I had. And then I, uh, you know, I wound up getting my uh, pension and went back to school and got rehired by the city. And now I do. Uh, I, I represent the city employees, and uh, I, I love my job. Uh, Whatever happened, you know, that kid on that bike, you know, uh, you know the old saying, God takes care of drunks, fools, and kids. I hit the trifecta that day. That kid was not hurt seriously. And, uh, and I thank God for that because if he were, if he were seriously injured, it probably would have changed the dynamics of the whole situation. I probably would have got arrested and I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to make amends to that kid. I did not know the kid personally, but I knew his family. He was the same age. He came from a very large family. He was the same age as one of my younger brothers, and I got to make amends to that guy. What happened to my mom? Uh, my mom died that day, and uh, I was sober almost five years before I was able to sit down and have a conversation with my father. And my father forgave me. He hugged me and forgave me, you know? Then I got an opportunity to uh, actually send my uh, father back to Ireland from the town which he was from, and it's the first time he's been back here since he's been a kid. So it's like a way to make amends. You know, when I was little, I remember I used to kiss my dad on the head before I went to bed, you know? And I remember my sister, I was about 13, 14, and my sister pulled me off to the side. She said, Bobby, men don't kiss men. You're not supposed to do that. And I never did that again. So I was sober a few, few years. Now when I see my dad go over and see him, I kiss him on the head. I, you know, my dad's a good, you know, he's almost 80. He's retired from the city himself, but he's in pretty good shape. And the older I get, I realize the smarter my father gets. You know, he's a pretty decent man. And if I ever uh, turn out to be half the guy that he is, then I'll be all right. I never married and had no kids. Uh, I don't bewail the institution of marriage. I came close a couple times, but you know, I'm still young too. I just turned 49, so no rush. You know, uh, I, I have, uh, I guess, uh, uh, last count, I think 29 nephews and nieces. Uh, the coil name is being carried on, that's for sure. So, and I don't feel my life is empty not being a father, but uh, I got a pretty good life today. You know. Uh, I was a runner, uh, you know, and a typical alcoholic, you know what, I, I'm just not happy jogging, right? I got to run the Boston Marathon, because that's the way we are. We, we don't, if it's good, we got to go all the way, right? So I'm training to do Boston, but to do Boston, you have to qualify. Uh, so uh, you, there's a lottery, but you usually have to qualify. So I'm, I'm actually training to do the Marine Corps Marathon, and... Uh, I'm not the most graceful guy. One day I tripped and I fell. It kind of hurt my, hurt my shoulder, was throwing my stride off. I said, man, I, I got to go check this out. So I go to the doctor. I, I got diagnosed with lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. I'm a little reefer for a short period of time, but that don't count. But I had never smoked a cigarette in my life before. And it wasn't the fall. It wasn't the trauma from the fall. It was actually tumor pressing against my lung. That's what the, the pain was. I'm 33 years old. I'm sober six years. I'm going places. I got things to do, people to see. I got to go. And I remember talking to my uh, sponsor, Troubles, who would be dead within a year of lung cancer. He had yet to be diagnosed. And, I, and, I, and he said, Bobby, what are you going to do? So I went through treatment, and I bounced back. It's pretty tough. When you're 33, you're sober six years. You tend to bounce back. I bounced back. I was doing good. Then I really got sick. And then they have actually removed. They had to remove my lung. And uh, I had a tough time physically and, and to be honest I had a tough time emotionally I, if I I don't want to give you the impression I handled this well actually when I got the second when I got the confirmation when the doctor gave it to me I actually physically got sick in his office you know and uh, I had a tough time with this and then but when I got out of the hospital I had even more of a tough time because I couldn't make meetings now I'm a meeting maker we got 1600 meetings a week there's no excuse not to make meetings you know well people start coming to my house 
I'm just not talking about sponsors and friends. I'm talking about people that I may have met at the assembly one or two times. I'm talking about people I never met, they're coming with friends of mine. And they're coming to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You're looking at a liar, thief, and a cheat. I took from everyone. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery. And people came to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a credible experience. I knew my doctors did a pretty good job, but I'm a big firm believer in prayer, you know? I was bounced back, I was doing good. I gained a couple of pounds, I glow in the dark, I know, but uh, I wound up, got, uh, I got another problem recently, and I actually have surgery scheduled this coming Tuesday. I'm getting uh, everything removed out of my throat, and I will be unable to speak or talk for about four or five weeks, which is good. I want to lose a couple of pounds, and uh, people in AA, especially my sponsees, they'll probably be happy I can't talk either. They'll just call me and torture me, you know. I, I got a pretty good life. I don't have an excuse to go out and get loaded. And you know what? Um, I've been around a while, I've been to thousands of meetings, and I've seen some men and women go through some terrible things for their own, and they got through it without picking up a drink 24 hours at a time. That's what God promises me. Life on life's terms, you know? It's a wonderful way of life. If you're new, I wish you well. I don't wish you luck, because luck ain't got nothing to do with it. I don't want you to think like uh, recovery is a lottery and the wheel spins on you and today's it's your day to drink. That's nonsense. I heard people said, I, I went through the steps and I still drank. That's nonsense too. Because nowhere in the 12 steps does it say go out and buy a 40. Go out and cop a bundle. It doesn't say that at all. In fact, the book that I got, maybe I got the misprint edition, there's actually a guarantee that I'll never pick up a drink. And that's working with other alcoholics. You know, whether they stay sober, that's just a bonus. You know, I stay sober. And it gets me out of myself. I grew up in a very blue collar, very ethnic neighborhood where the sign very few people went to, uh, I mean, you went to high school and very few people went to uh, secondary school after that. The sign of success was to get a union card. I mean, we lived close to the docks. You became a longshoreman. You worked in the refineries. You got a job like that. Or you joined one of the trades. Iron worker, electrician. Not a carpenter. Car they're scabs. Uh, but uh, <laughs> electricians, carpenters, uh, well, iron workers. The deal is when you join one of the trades, it's like uh, you go to school. You're, you're an apprentice, right? So one day a week you go to school, four days a week you work. And then at the end of your five years, you're a journeyman iron, iron worker. Alcoholics Anonymous is the same way. We show up, we're apprentices. We get yourself a journeyman, we get yourself a sponsor. Make sure your sponsor has done the steps. I, I'm almost done, so I say these controversial remarks for the end. Make sure your sponsor has done the steps. If he or she has not done the steps, he or she has no business sponsoring you. I know, how do you find out they did the steps? You ask them. You're gonna hear two things, yes or no. The person says yes, that's your person. He or she takes you under their wing. They share an experience with you. You get your experience. You become a journeyman. Or you take an apprentice under your wing. It's been working that way since June 10th of 1935. Why do you need a dirt ball from South Philadelphia to come down here and tell you to do it any differently? You know? It's a wonderful way of life. I'm glad I'm sober. I wish you all th a happy Thanksgiving. And thank you very much for the privilege of participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all I got. Thanks.